Hello, good afternoon and welcome to this shared ownership webinar, uh, Financial Basics for Shared Ownership. My name is Mark Brennan, the Shared Ownership Manager for Local Energy Scotland. Here today with Simon Robinson, our Financial Conduct Authority accredited financial advisor to go through a number of slides here uh, to explain the ins and outs of shared ownership finances. I think we'll take questions as we go along. So if you raise your hand in the webinar on the screen there, then uh, Simon and I will have a go at uh, answering these questions and have something of a discussion about some of these topics if uh, if that's what uh, that's what materializes here. So uh, I think the idea of the webinar really is to give community groups and community reps especially uh, an understanding of the basic principles and the terminology for shared ownership finance so that they can engage more effectively with uh, financial advisors and banks and funders um, and everyone involved in the investment process for shared ownership of uh, larger uh, renewables projects. Okay, so Local Energy Scotland, as we all know, I think, or most of us will know, manages CARES, which is the Scottish Government's Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. And CARES provides grants and loans to communities to help them to access shared ownership offers and renewable energy project developers. Uh, the enablement grant of 25,000 is the most important for this to fund initial feasibility assessments Sometimes, uh, depending on the structure of the shared ownership or the project, development loans uh, might be appropriate, but more often than not, enablement grant will be the main support, as well as support provided by ourselves and the local development officers in uh, the different areas throughout the country. And for financial advice, of course, get in touch with, with Simon Robinson. More details on Local Energy Scotland website. There's a shared ownership section there now with all of the links to the various uh, tools and uh, information available that we've put together for you. So over to Simon now to take you through the slides. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Mark said, uh, my name's Simon Robinson. I run a company called Snowbridge in Edinburgh, um, and there's some information about it there on your screens, uh, which I won't read through. Um, um, we have the ability to uh, see when you raise your hands within this uh, webinar um, software. So if you have a question as we're running through any of these slides, then please do raise your hand. Uh, what we will do is we'll activate your microphone so that you can uh, ask the question and everyone can hear it. Um, and then we'll do our very best to answer it uh, coherently and concisely. Um, but we thought that was more efficient than typing in questions. So hopefully it will work. Uh, please bear with us if there's any technical problems when we try that out. So, the first part of this is about funding renewable energy projects. So, we wanted to take a step back and rather than looking specifically at uh, shared ownership in detail, first we wanted to look at how do you fund a project and then we can use that knowledge to have a better understanding of how that applies in a shared ownership context. Here is a very simplified diagram for how you fund a renewable energy project. There's two bits of funding, um, two different sources of funding. One of them is typically bigger than the other. Um, the top one is senior debt normally, and that comes from a senior uh, commercial bank, someone like RBS, Santander, Lloyds, uh, as they're fond of saying on the BBC, other banks are available. Um, other specialist banks, such as Triodos or Close Brothers, again, other banks are available. This funding source usually accounts for between 65 and 80% of total project costs. And where it sits within that range depends on a number of different factors. But an example might be the technology that's being used for a particular project. It might depend on the revenue streams that the project is accessing. It might depend on the size of the project. It might depend on exactly who is borrowing the money, who is behind um, the particular development. 
So there are many different things that can feed into it. But it, as, as a ballpark, it'll, it'll be somewhere in the range of 65 to 80% of total costs. In an unsubsidized project, and that's clearly where the world is moving to, um, there is a little bit more uncertainty around revenue streams. So you might find that the total level of debt could be closer to 50%. Um, however, there are ways of improving the situation with an unsubsidized project, including corporate PPAs and sleeving arrangements and those types of things. We'll come on to those later on, um, but that is the, the reason why many of you will have heard a lot of talk about corporate PPAs and sleeving arrangements and similar things recently is because it's a way of increasing the amount of debt that you can get into a project. So where does the rest of the money come from? Well, the rest of the money comes from equity, as it's known. Sponsor equity is provided by the owner of the project, and that's the company that owns the project, to fund the balance of the construction costs. Now, that can come in a variety of different forms. In a traditional wind farm development, for instance, you would get a, a, a large um, developer who would go through the consenting process, would spend the money that was required in order to do noise assessments, uh, shadow flicker assessments, uh, wildlife surveys, visual impact studies, and then submit a planning application to the local council. They would receive their planning application, and then when they came to build the project, they would go and talk to banks. Now, if the bank said, we're very happy to give you 70% of the total cost of the project, the sponsor would then need to put in the balance, the 30% of the cost that, uh, that was outstanding. So that's a very basic, there, there are lots of variations on this and lots of complexity we could go into, uh, but this is the basic picture. And I think this is a picture that's worth bearing in your mind as we go through the presentation when we're talking about debt, when we're talking about equity, this is, this is how a normal project in, in the renewables industry would stack up. So what is senior debt? Well, senior debt within renewable energy is normally lent using what's called a project finance, uh, project finance structure. From a community's perspective, when considering these projects, and also from a developer's perspective, that's an incredibly important um, thing to realize. What it means is that the debt is secured entirely on the cash flows of the project. So normally, a special company will be established in order to develop and own the project. That's called the Special Purpose Vehicle, or SPV. And the only purpose of that company will be to own the project. So there will be nothing else Within that company, they typically don't even have employees. And the reason for doing that is because when the bank lends money to the project in a project finance structure, it lends money to that company. If the company or the project has difficulty repaying the bank, the only security that the bank has is that company. So they can step in and they can take control of the company and they can take control of the project, but they cannot go after any of the owners of that project. So it insulates the community and the developer from any potential negative consequences if they can't pay their debt. Um, there are other types of financing available, asset financing and things like that, which have different security structures. We won't go into all of those right now. Um, again, we're, we're talking about uh, a very basic, uh, normal project within renewable energy, uh, and we're trying not to go into some of the complexities and nuances that sometimes arise. Uh, so for, for, for the purposes of this presentation, I think this is the, the picture to keep in your mind. Yeah, Sam, I think we've mentioned this before, but sometimes it might be helpful, the analogy here for folk is it's similar in a lot of ways to a mortgage arrangement, which we're, most of us will be familiar with. 
yeah. defense rate, is it? Yeah, exactly. So it's similar to a mortgage arrangement where if you were to buy a house, uh, you might be able to convince um, a, a friendly bank to lend you 70% of the value of the house. And if you were able to find uh, the other 30% of the value of the house down the back of the city, then that 30% is your equity in the house. The 70% is the bank debt. Um, on the point of security, the in that example, the security for the bank is the house. So if you don't make your debt repayments, the bank will say, well, that's that's all fine, um, and they will take ownership of the house. It's similar in a project finance structure for a renewable energy project, but they take ownership of the project. So project finance is used in cases where assets cannot easily be moved or sold. And I think that's a very important thing to realize other types of financing are available for things like biomass boilers because ultimately the bank could take possession of the boiler uh ship it somewhere else and sell it on the second hand market to try and uh, recover some of their money the types of things we're talking about here are wind farms um hydro stations very large power stations where it's not easy to simply pick it up and sell it on the on the second hand market um as, as a little bit of uh, history, project finance was originally developed for offshore oil platforms, which again are quite difficult to pick up and move. Uh, so that's why this structure was, was developed and that's why the banks take security on the cash flows. Um, I guess we've got a question at the moment. moment. Yeah. So it's from uh, Kristen Go, Go if, Go, if that's all right. Sorry, I'm going to unmute you now, uh, Kristen. Hello. Hello there. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Hello, sorry, Kristen. Hello. Okay. It sounds like there's some sound issues. So, uh, Christian, perhaps the best thing to do would be to type the question into the question box, and then um, my colleagues here can read it out to me, and then we can answer it that way. Project finance is typically the structure that's used for these types of assets. Um, and the important thing to realize is that the people who are the shareholders of the project are normally protected in the event that the project does not perform. So the bank cannot be the shareholders. Okay. Okay. Um, so the question has just come through from uh, Kristen. Sorry about that, Kristen. And um, uh, where heat? Uh, so just just wondering where heat pumps fit into the project finance. That's uh, an excellent question. Um, it depends entirely on the heat pump. I'm going to use a slightly flippant um, answer for you, if you forgive me. So the way to work out whether an asset can be project financed is that you have to pretend that you can see the whole project site in front of you and you can hold it in your hand. And if you were to pick up the entire project site in your hand, you'd obviously have to be very big, but if you were to pick it up in your hand and turn it upside down and shake it, then if the bits don't fall off, then it's likely to be project finance. So something like a heat pump, if it's very well integrated into a heat network and it's part of an energy center and it's got lots of associated pipe work with it then normally what you'd find is that would be a project finance kind of situation rather than asset finance asset finance is used typically for things like uh, reciprocating engines or uh, peaking gas turbines where they're containerized and it's very easy to simply pick them up, put them on the back of a flatbed truck and take them down the road to sell them second hand. Uh, so I hope, I hope that answers the, the question. So why, why is debt important? Now we've been talking about debt for five or 10 minutes. Well, the reason is very simple really. The higher the proportion of senior debt that you can get into a project, the higher the returns will be for the shareholders. So in a shared ownership project, if you're a community and you are forming part of the equity investment, then 
this means that your your returns, the community's benefit from the project will be higher if there's a higher level of senior debt. Um, that is vital because quite often in a, in a shared ownership project, the amount of money that the community is required to invest is beyond uh, what they have in the bank. And that means that they need to go and borrow some money from another party. Now, that might be in the form of um, a specialist lender, such as the ETH Fund. Uh, it might be someone like um, Social Investment Scotland or the Charities Aid Foundation or a, another sort of social impact investor like that. Or it could be through uh, a crowdfunding campaign or a similar structure where shareholders are promised a particular return on their investment every year. Irrespective of the route that you go down, there will be a cost attached to that funding. So you would need to pay interest to EF or Social Investment Scotland or Charities Aid Foundation. Uh, and you would need to pay some sort of return to shareholders in a crowdfunding campaign. If the equity returns on an investment are not very high because you don't have a lot of debt, say they're something like six or seven percent, then if you have to borrow, uh, if, if you have to pay your underlying investors four or five percent, there's a very small gap in the middle. And effectively, that gap is the money that the community pays. So the, the community keeps. So to put some numbers on it, if the community borrows £100 to invest in the project and the equity return is, say, 7%, then every year the community will receive £7. But if they need to pay their underlying investors 5% interest, then they would pay away five pounds of the seven pounds they receive, and the community is only left with two. Using those very simple numbers, you can see that it would be a lot better from the community's perspective if they had a project that had an equity return of 12%, say, uh, then they would be able to keep seven pounds, uh, even after paying away their five pounds. So, it's very, very important for community projects to be structured in a way that allows senior debt to be the majority source of funding. Is this where maybe an understanding of uh, internal rates of return uh, help you? Yeah, so, so I've, I've been using simple rates of return there, 7%, but as Mark says, in reality, um, what people use uh, in the market is the the jargon is an IRR or an internal rate of return. Um, all, all that is, is a, a compound rate of return. Uh, so it's really very simple. Um, and so if, if you invest a hundred pounds, let's keep, keep it a hundred pounds example, because hundred pounds is a nice easy number. Um, if you invest a hundred pounds at an internal rate of return of 10%, then at the end of year one, then, it would be worth 110 pounds because it's gone up by 10 percent but at the end of year two it would be worth 121 pounds because it's gone up by 10 pounds on the original investment of 100 but you've also gained 10 percent on the 10 pounds that you made in year one and so on so the internal rate of return is, is a compound rate of return um there's a there's a very useful rule of thumb that you can use if you want to look incredibly clever with people called the rule of 72. Um, it works for internal rates of return of around seven, eight, nine, ten percent or something like that. If uh, if someone says to you that a project has an internal rate of return of seven percent, say, then if you divide 72 by seven, you get about 10. So if someone says to you, this project has an internal rate of return of about seven percent, you could look at them very quickly and say, hmm, that means you would double your return within about 10 years. The rule of 72 is very useful. So using the same rule, if the internal rate of return is 10%, you know that you would double your money within about seven years. Uh, it, it is very much a rule of thumb. It's not accurate, but uh, it, it can be 
it can make you look very clever. So I was just going to ask again, uh, as a rule of thumb, perhaps, the CARES financial model, one of the key sort of outputs in the summary table is the IRR and the net present value. What maybe, is there any, anything there, a rule of thumb you could be looking for there? Um, well, so a, a target IRR, as we've said, we want that to be um, nice and high because the higher it is, the more flexibility a community has when it comes to raising money. Um, so a high IRR means that the community will typically be able to keep a greater proportion of the of the project returns rather than using that to pay their own funding costs. In terms of a net present value, net present values are, um, I think it's fair to say, definitely an art rather than a science. Um, a, a net present value is an attempt to say what is the total return of the project worth in today's money. So there are a couple of ways of thinking about that. One way of thinking about it might be to think about inflation. If, if there's inflation of 2%, then if I have 100 pounds today, at 2% inflation, I could I, today I can buy hundred pounds worth of goods, but in a year's time, if prices have gone up by 2%, then I'll only be able to buy 98 pounds worth of goods. So I'll, I'll be able to buy less. So hundred pounds today is worth less than hundred pounds in a year's time. And a net present value tries to quantify that. Now, clearly the key number therefore is what inflation rate we're assuming. So if you're assuming 10%, then £100 today can buy a lot less next year. If you're assuming 1%, then actually the difference between this year and next year is, is not a lot. So when you see a net present value, you will always see next to it a discount rate. And the discount rate is the adjustment that's being made for future the future inflation. The way it works in practice is a little bit more complicated than I've said because it wouldn't exactly be £98 in year two. It's a slightly more difficult, um, slightly more complicated calculation than that. Um, but the, uh, the the crux of it is that money at the end of next year is worth less than money today, and money the year, at the end of the year after that is worth less than both of them. And the net present value tries to quantify that. With a, with a renewable energy project, it means that if you have a 15-year debt facility, for instance, and then the community is receiving some quite large dividends for the last five years of the project, let's assume it's a 20-year project. So from year 16 onwards, the community is receiving quite a large dividend. It can be quite important to have a little think about what that might be worth in today's money. Because in 15 years' time, with compound with the compounding effects of inflation, you might find that it's worth quite a lot less than the numbers on the piece of paper. Uh, so it's definitely worth having an awareness of net present values. Um, as I say, though, they are very much an art rather than a science. Um, and the discount rates that people use can be can be very important. There, there are other ways to think about it, but let's, I'll, I'm going to leave it at inflation for now. The other thing I would note is that there is a relationship between the IRR and the net present value. Um, so without going into an enormous amount of detail, if your discount rate for your net present value, i.e. your assumed inflation, is less than your IRR, then, then you're going to have a positive IRR. And if your discount rate is greater than your IRR, you're going to have a negative IRR, sorry, a negative net present value. And so the net present value and the discount rate are related like that. It might, it might be worth actually just explaining discount rates in, in a second way to make that a little bit clearer. If I'm an investor and I have borrowed money to fund a project at 
I want the project to return more than 5% because otherwise I can't pay my debt. So if, if I want the project to return more than 5%, then that tells me that if the project return, the project IRR is greater than 5%, I can pay my debt and I can keep a bit of money for myself. Therefore, the project will have a positive net present value for me because I will be keeping some money. If, on the other hand, I'm borrowing my money at 5% and the project's IRR is less than 5%, then the project has a negative value and I shouldn't pursue it. So, as I say, there's, there's many ways to think about this. It's very easy to disappear uh, into the weeds. Um, there's all sorts of theory behind it. I think the best thing is that if, if and when you have a project and you'd like to talk about that, the specifics of that project in a bit more detail, please get in contact with CARES um, and I will be, be there and available to go and uh, go, go to meetings, talk through financial models and help you think through the different risks and features of, of a particular example. So typical project cash flows, I thought I'd put this in because I think it's particularly relevant for shared ownership projects. This shows you, and it doesn't really matter what, what the bars are, it's, it's really the shape of the curve that matters. So you can see there from years one to 10, we have um, gently increasing bars. What that shows is that the project revenue and costs are uh, subject to inflation. And so every year, the revenues go up a bit, the costs go up a bit, and the cash flow that comes to the shareholders as a result um, also goes up a bit. Now, in years one to 10, normally there is some senior debt. It might not be 10 years, it might be 15, or it might be seven. But let's, let's say it's 10 for this example. So there is some senior debt, and that means that although you receive some cash flows from the project, you then have to pay your debt repayments and your interest. And so after you've paid debt repayments and interest, there's not an enormous amount left for the shareholders. I'm oh, sorry, I should have made clear at the beginning, these are, these are cash flows to the ultimate owners of the project, to the shareholders. So years one to 10 are a little bit thin, because you have to repay the money that you borrowed to, um, to pay for the project. So that is the senior debt term, and that's why, uh, as I say, those bars are not as, not as high as the rest. Then, on a, on a very happy day at the end of year 10, you repay your final bit of debt and shake hands with the bank, and you're free of them. So at that point, the project has no debt, and it has uh, all, all of the cash flows are available to the shareholders. You'll see there's a big spike in year 11, um, and that is something called the DSRA release. This is particular to a project finance facility. Um, what the bank will have asked you to do for years one to 10 is to uh, basically keep some money in a savings account. And the reason they want you to keep the money in the savings account is because if for any reason you can't pay them or you're a bit late, then the bank has a bit of money that they can use as partial security against your future payments. Once you make your final payment to the bank, of course, they don't need this anymore. So they release it. And so you get an extra little bump in income because suddenly you're free to distribute uh, that money to the owners of the project, which of course will, will include the community in a shared ownership project. And then for the remaining years of operation, so years 11 through to 25 in this particular example, you will receive the difference between the project revenues and the operating costs. And as you can see, again, because of inflation, the cash flows are gently rising over time. Now, We've mentioned inflation, or I've mentioned inflation a couple of times in this slide. Please bear in mind that because of the net present value, 
Um, if, you're, if your costs are going up and your revenues are going up, then that can be wonderful because the, the amount of money you're receiving is going up over a year. But that, of course, might not be worth any more to the community if the cost of everything else in the economy is going up at the same time. So although it looks like you're receiving more money at the end, the actual utility or purchasing power of that money might not actually be going up every year because all other prices are going up as well. So that's that's the important thing to know about these projects. They always have this particular shape, um, but it's worth just pausing and thinking about uh, why they have that shape and what the key features are. Again, the mortgage analogy might be helpful here. It's the same sort of shape, I guess. Yes, exactly. When you pay off your mortgage, if you had money put aside for the rainy day when income might have been a bit, bit less, etc., then that can be released and income is uh, then released as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so so I, I can't remember uh, whether I explained what DSRA is. DSRA is Debt Service Reserve Account, um, and it's a, it's a bank acronym that they love to use because Debt Service Reserve Account is a, is a real mouthful. So now let's talk about funding options. Um, and I think it's always uh, interesting to think about this, first of all, from the perspective of the funders. So in a shared ownership project, um, who might give you money and why? So banks, first of all, love guaranteed prices. And that actually applies to um, people who might fund shared ownership projects as well. So uh, whether it's um, a social lender or whether it's um, a government-backed lender such as EF, or whether it's uh, a crowdfunding platform, all funders love guaranteed prices because what it means is that in, in, in any, let's take a wind project as a good example, there are two big sources of risk for revenue. Uh, by risk, I mean variability uh, on a year-to-year, on a -year and month-to-month, and day-to-day -day basis. So the, the first source of variability is the wind, because as many of you will have noticed, the wind does not blow at a constant speed every day. Um, and the second source of uncertainty is the price that you receive for selling your electricity. Um, now, the reason that the ROC scheme, the FIT scheme, and the Contract for Difference schemes have been so successful is because they, to a greater or lesser extent, remove that variability in the price. And so that means that the only thing funders really need to worry about is whether or not the wind is going to blow in the case of a wind farm. Um, because most of them are investing for quite a long period, probably for 10 years or perhaps longer. And therefore, they can make an assumption that on average, the wind will blow at a certain rate over those very long time periods. So they become less worried about the day-to-day -day variability of the wind. And they can completely ignore, in the case of feed and tariff and contract for difference, they can completely ignore the variability in the price. Um, without one of these support schemes, funders suddenly have to think about wholesale electricity prices. And those are pretty complicated. So they vary half hour by half hour. Uh, so there, there are 48 separate trading periods every day, 365 days a year. There are um, forward markets. There are hedging opportunities. There's all sorts of complexity. And uh, a typical bank, and certainly um, a social lender or a government-backed lender, and, and definitely someone investing in a crowdfunding, will really not want to have to worry about that. Um, it, makes, it makes the income from the project very, very difficult to predict, because suddenly you depend on external factors. You might find one day that the electricity price is enormously high, because a nuclear power station in France has had to stop operating because of some problem. Or you might find that the electricity price one day is incredibly low because it's, an, it's a beautiful, beautiful sunny day 
and everyone's on holiday, so no one's using any electricity, and it's lovely and warm, so all the heating is off, and the wind is blowing incredibly fast, so there's tons of power. Um, so all of that variability makes things very, very difficult to predict. And what you would, the impact of that, if you think back to the picture we had of the two sources of funding for a project, the variability will mean that the bank will be less willing to lend money, so they would lend less money to the project. So what has been the impact of the end of subsidies? Well, as we said on the previous slide, the, the ROC scheme has ended. Um, the feed-in tariff scheme will come to an end shortly. Um, and uh, the only thing that is really left is the contract for differences scheme, but that only applies to uh, remote island wind. So that's broadly speaking, um, onshore wind projects on the Scottish islands. So for anything on the mainland, funders have a lot less certainty about project income. And we're seeing that now as they lend less money to so-called unsubsidized projects. Um, because the percentage of the project costs that can be borrowed is being reduced, the equity returns are lower to investors. Um, and that is having the knock-on impact that economies of scale are becoming more important. By economies of scale, we basically mean project size. So if you have to build a road in order to install turbines, then the cost per megawatt is going to be a lot lower if you have a lot more megawatts. And for shared ownership, this has obvious implications. We've just received a question. Uh, sorry. Sorry, there's a, there's a comment here saying it's worth noting the renewable heat incentive. Yes, completely agree. Um, the renewable heat incentive does still provide some certainty for uh, heat projects, definitely. Um, and uh, that is a, a very useful source of revenue support because it removes that, um, some of that uh, variability. Um, so for shared ownerships, the implications of all of this is that larger projects, um, particularly some of the onshore wind projects that we're seeing now, uh, mean that a larger investment is typically required from a community. So if you have to, if, if you have an opportunity in uh, a shared ownership project to buy a 10% interest, then 10% uh, of a 10 megawatt wind farm is likely to be a lot more manageable than 10% of a 200 megawatt wind farm um, in terms of the uh, amount of money that is required. Uh, that's really just an observation. I don't want to uh, pretend that I can present a solution for that. That's something that I know an, an awful lot of people are working on um, and trying to find new ways to mobilize large amounts of money for some of these uh, very big shared ownership projects is uh, obviously an absolutely uh, key piece of work for, for Local Energy Scotland and, and the team here at CARES. I think it just strikes me as well that uh, certainty is something, guarantees of prices is something that the community groups and shared ownership arrangements would uh, favour as well. That's what yes. they're looking for and the lack of the revenue support or the subsidies now means that it's a different sort of uh, uh, prospect now yes. in and assessing it's... these projects. There's more risk in there and uh, certainly to, to look for certainty. It's this, this is absolutely right and, th and this is why this 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 point about subsidies coming to an end uh, and lack of price certainty is the reason why people are now looking at, um, for instance, corporate PPAs, where you enter into a long-term fixed price contract to sell your power with a particular, particular company um, or a local user. It's also what's driving um, some of the interest in batteries at the moment, because if you, um, if you have a project like a, let's go back to wind again, because it's easy to think about. If you have a project like a, a wind um, project where you generate electricity whenever the wind blows, you might find that the electricity price is low at the point when you're generating it. So if you were able to store it, 
and sell it when prices were higher, then you might be able to improve your project revenues. So a lot of these complexities that are now being added to these types of projects are intended to try and address this particular problem and try and improve revenue visibility for the ultimate owners and funders of, of a project. Um, other considerations to think about from a shared ownership um, perspective, I mean, obviously, the revenue variability is a, is a key one, um, the end of subsidies, and we've also touched on the importance of senior debt. Subordination is a slightly ugly word, but what it means is really that the senior debt is, is called senior because it sits at the top of the capital structure. So what that means is when a project has revenue, then it will receive some money and then it will have to pay some operating costs. And those might include um, a lease payment to a landowner. It might include, um, in the case of a heat project, it might include the electricity bill if there's a heat pump. Um, it might include uh, the cost of the internet connection in order to um, in order to allow real-time monitoring of the performance. So there could be all sorts of things in there. Once the costs are paid, then you, you will have an amount of money hopefully left over uh, from the revenue. The very first person who then gets repaid out of that money is the senior lender, and that's why they're called senior. So from the perspective of a community uh, shared ownership project, the community will always rank behind the senior debt. Anyone, therefore, who lends money to a community needs to understand that they will only ever receive interest or uh, debt repayments or dividends or whatever else they're entitled to under the particular funding structure after the senior debt has been uh, looked after. And that means the full repayment and the full interest has been paid to them. So that can cause difficulty for some funders because it means there's a bit of extra risk. There's an added risk that there might not be enough money to pay them what they are owed. Um, and therefore, it tends to be quite um, a specialist type of uh, institution who enters into this market or, or a crowdfunding uh, type of arrangement. And this is this point is really why the uh, EF fund and its predecessor, the REEF fund, have been so incredibly valuable in stimulating uh, community and, and shared ownership projects in, in Scotland over, over recent years. Uh, a related point to that is lack of control. Uh, it's very likely that the developer of a project would want to offer a small stake to a community. It might be 10% or it might be 20%, it might even be 30%. Um, but it's unlikely to be enough that the community has any ability to influence the day-to-day -day running of the project. Uh, and what that means is that anybody who lends money to the community or who uh, invests in a crowdfunding is doing so in the knowledge that that community doesn't have the ability to uh, amend things that they are unhappy with within the project. So that lack of control is something that um, can cause concerns. It is typically dealt with using a legal document between the community and the developer uh, called a shareholders agreement uh, in, in the case where a community has got a direct investment in the project. Um, and it's well worth talking to the carers team about your shareholders agreement and getting some legal support because uh, they, can, they, they can be quite uh, complicated uh, and they take a little bit of thinking through in order to make sure that the community's interests are uh, protected in, in so far as they can be. Um, a third thing to be aware of is the lack of security. So um, a senior project finance lender will have what is called step-in rights for a project. And that means that if they don't get repaid and they're concerned about the future viability of the project, they can take control of it 
um, and they can uh, effectively, they will take the majority shareholders ownership stake. So at that point, the, the senior lender would, would be running things and the community would then be a minority partner. The senior lender would of course be uh, doing their best to recover their money. And so there might end up being uh, a conflict of interest between them and, and what the community is looking for from the project. Um, anyone who has lent money to the community uh, in order for them to make their investment or anyone who's participated in a crowdfunding uh, would not have similar stepping rights. Um, so they would, they would need to be more comfortable that the project was going to perform as expected and they would need to um, be comfortable that they were receiving a return that reflected the risk they were taking on the project as a result of that. Um, and the final point to touch on is volatility once again. Um, I use the words risk and volatility uh, interchangeably in a, in a financial sense, they mean the same thing. Um, the senior debt repayment schedule will be fixed at the point when the community or sorry, when the project borrows the money from the senior lender. So what that means is that if you have variable revenue and the revenue goes up and down uh, on a monthly or annual basis, any shortfall below the expected uh, level of revenue will have a disproportionate impact on the community lender. And the way to do this is to go back to our example of hundred pounds again. If we assume that our annual income from a project is £100 and we, uh, for the sake of argument, let's assume we have uh, high debt repayments. So let's say that in total debt repayment and interest, we owe the senior lender £80 out of our 100 So we've got our £100, which is revenue minus operating costs, um, and we pay £80 to our senior lender and we're left with 20 at the community level in order to repay our funders and hopefully keep a little bit for the community. If the project has a very, very good year and that uh, operating cash flow that they receive is 110 pounds instead of 100, then we still owe the bank 80 pounds, but the community at the end is left with 30, not 20. So we've got 50% more than we would have done. And it's brilliant because hopefully the community can put some money aside for a rainy day, or perhaps invest in, in something for the local area for the benefit of the local people. Uh, but conversely, if you have a, a bad year and your uh, operating cash flow is 10% less than you expected, then you will only receive 90 uh, pounds. You still owe 80 pounds to the bank, but that means the community at the end is only left with 10. So you get half of the income that you would expect it, uh, would have expected at the beginning of the year um, and that could also cause problems so really what i'm i mean as as mark will will say it's exactly the same as a mortgage where you have house prices going up and down um, the effect on your equity in your house is disproportionate it's exactly the same thing here uh, the impact of senior debt in the project is to amplify the volatility for anyone who is um further down the capital structure. I think, isn't it, that uh, yeah, for these reasons, lack of security, volatility, and the control that, you, you know, uh, shared ownership of the community stake is often through a specialist lender, yes. particularly if, and that's their place, or has yes. become their place in the market. All, all, yeah. all of these reasons really contribute to um, the fact that there used to be uh, what's, what's called a funding gap in the market. So a community wanting to take advantage of uh, a shared ownership opportunity um, could, could often find it incredibly difficult to find a source of money that would, um, that would allow them to do that. And certainly in the very early days of um, community energy in Scotland, I'm talking sort of uh, eight, nine, ten years ago, uh, it was very very difficult for communities to, to participate in these kinds of structures the um the creation of the reef fund and then and then of course the EF fund after that 
um, has had an absolutely enormous impact because they're able to uh, have a deeper understanding of all of these risks and take more time to really get to know the projects. Um, and, and that has unlocked an awful lot of these um, community energy opportunities for everyone. Um, third party assistance. I think this is uh, absolutely key for all communities. Every community organization has different sets of skills, uh, different people involved and different expertise. Um, but there will almost always be a gap. Um, and at Local Energy Scotland, we always think in terms of these four different buckets of advisors that you would want to think about engaging. So the first is legal advisors. Uh, you will certainly want legal advisors to advise on the corporate structure, your agreement with the developers. Previously, I called that a, a shareholders agreement. There are other terms that you might use. Um, if you're not, if the community is not taking a direct ownership in a project, then there might be a different kind of agreement with the developers. But there will always be there will always be some sort of contract. Um, any fundraising documents, particularly um, as uh, shared ownership has become more widely um, available uh, or more, there will become more opportunities, then crowdfunding has become more prevalent. Um, and certainly there have been some comments recently from the Financial Conduct Authority around the sustainability of certain crowdfunding models and the fairness of those models for the underlying investors it's well worth having uh, legal advisors that can help you think about any fundraising documents and, and make sure that um, anything you're doing is going to be uh, approved um, financial advisors might be necessary to advise on the fundri fundraising or to uh, represent the community's interests with potential funders to advise on any documentation if the community is going to uh, borrow money in order to invest in a project. Um, and also, I mean, e even to compare different funding offers, quite often uh, if a community is presented with two or three different uh, options for funding, uh, which would obviously be a fantastic position to be in, um, then it can be quite difficult to compare them side by side and work out which one's really best. So a financial advisor who has the experience to go through any uh, term sheets or proposed contracts and work out the implications of the structures that are being uh, proposed could be uh, very helpful in order to understand the community's risks and also their potential rewards. Uh, finally, technical advisors might be necessary uh, I'd say this is increasingly becoming the case, um, particularly for some newer technologies. Uh, we've talked about heat and heat pumps already. Um, there are uh, increasing numbers of energy from waste projects coming on uh, in Scotland, some of which are talking about um, having opportunities for shared ownership. Um, some of the technologies that are used there are quite uh, novel. Um, and you would want to get a technical advisor to give you an opinion on, on viability and, and technical risk. Um, technical advisors can also be useful for uh, advising on things like battery storage or uh, any new technologies that might get integrated. Um, as, as, a, as an example, there have been um, combined wind and battery projects and combined solar and battery projects that have been looked at by a number of developers uh, in Scotland. Um, and understanding any interface risk between the generating asset and the storage asset, um, and, and also the um, software that manages that interface can be quite important. Um, and then finally, I would say that depending on the amount of capacity that the community has, um, it could be well worth uh, employing a third party project manager to, to work on the project full time 
um, particularly when it comes towards financial close on a project, which is the point where the community enters into a funding agreement and, and actually signs the, the legal documentation, the, the, the month or two leading up to that point can be very, very intensive indeed. And having someone who is in the office eight hours a day and five days a week, uh, managing all of the different advisors and understanding the community's position at all times is, uh, is something that really does pay dividends. Uh, we thought we would touch on different ownership models briefly because we've been talking about shared ownership, um, but really there are three different, well, there are many different models, but there are three that we see more often than others. So in summary, there's a joint venture, shared revenue, and then split ownership. Um, we'll start from the top left and go, uh, go clockwise. It's a shame that we didn't have four actually, but uh, I, think, I think really we have, to have, we have to put up with that little gap in the bottom right there. Um, a joint venture project means that the community owns shares in the project company. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that the community will directly benefit from its shareholding in the form of dividends. It also means that if the project, for instance, has a decommissioning liability because it needs to be decommissioning at the end of the project life, um, then the community could potentially be liable for that. And you would certainly want to understand that position at the beginning of any uh, process rather than finding out suddenly after year 20. Um, it means that if the project was ever to be repowered, then the community could potentially stand to benefit from that. So um, an example might be a wind farm coming towards the end of its life where the project company is considering reapplying for planning permission uh, for uh, more modern, more efficient turbines. The community uh, would potentially have the opportunity to, to participate in that as a, as a shareholder. Um, and obviously, any community who thinks that that might be uh, something they wanted to look at, please, please ring CARES, because uh, there are all sorts of questions that would arise in that sort of structure. Um, so joint venture is, is, an interesting, um, is an interesting model. Uh, two things I should note, uh, importantly, one is that it doesn't need to be a traditional company and, and shareholding. There have been uh, examples of communities investing through other corporate vehicles, such as limited liability partnerships. Um, I mean, really, from a practical perspective, it all comes to the same thing in the end. The, the company receives a share of the income. Um, the other thing I should point out as an advantage of this type of structure is that if the project was ever to be sold by the developer, then the community would, of course, uh, potentially benefit from a windfall as a result of that project sale. Um, and again, there are lots of nuances around the precise legal documentation and agreement between the community and the developer, which would impact how that would work. Um, so it really is a case of every project is different. Um, but again, if, if any community were ever to find themselves in that position, uh, I would suggest that the first thing you ought to do is pick up the telephone and speak to CARES, um, because it can get quite complicated quite quickly. Um, shared revenue is another type of project that we see quite often. In this example, the community would invest in the project um, and in return for their investment, they would receive a contractual right to a percentage of the income that the project uh, generates. But what they don't have is a direct shareholding. So you might have a contract that says for the first 
uh, 20 years of operation, the community can receive 10% of the, of the returns from the project as long as they invest 10% of the required equity into the project. From the developer's perspective, this is quite nice because it means that they can fulfill their uh, promises for shared ownership, but they also retain 100% control and ownership of the project. Um, it means that from the community's perspective, if there was ever to be a liability, for instance, a decommissioning liability at the end of the project where money needed to be put into the company, then uh, they obviously wouldn't have that risk. Um, but on the other hand, it means that if the project was ever to be sold, the community uh, would not receive a windfall payment. The contract would simply continue in the normal way. Um, at the end of the period of that contract, the any relationship between the community and the project simply comes to an end. Um, and there isn't any ongoing involvement for, for the community. Um, one thing that is worth pointing out, though, is that potentially this kind of structure can provide the community with better security. And the reason I say that is because if you were to go into this kind of structure, it may be possible to structure the contract so that the community receives their share of the project revenue before the bank payments are made. And so that means that the community's return by definition would be less risky uh, i.e. I, less volatile. I'm using the words risk and volatility interchangeably again, um, because the community would be paid before the senior lender. So that could be an attraction of this kind of structure. Um, the final one I'm coming on to is split ownership. Now, this is something that used to be, we've seen a few of these, they're not common anymore, but we wanted to cover it off. Uh, really, uh, just to make sure that we had we had mentioned it. Um, split ownership is when a, 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 a wind farm is physically divided. I'm using wind farms again as an example because it's easy to think about. The wind farm is physically divided into two parts. Um, so this is the uh, the case of there being a community turbine, where you might have a ten a ten turbine wind farm, and one of the turbines is the community turbine. Um, I mean, really, there is no benefit in having a single identified turbine that is the one that belongs to the community. Um, what it means is it's, uh, a, it's a legal nightmare um, in terms of contracting. Um, and all that is really happening is that the community's uh, risk is being increased. If, if the community owns 10% of a um, 10, 10 turbine wind farm and one of the turbines fails, then 90% 90, 90 of the turbines, i.e. 9 out of 10, are still operating fine and the community would still receive some income. But if the community owns one specific turbine out of the 10 and that one happens to fail, the community would receive nothing So uh, and, until it was fixed. So really, there's there's no advantage to it. Um, if, if, you, if it would be an advantage to the community or, or beneficial for there to be a single identified turbine that is theirs, I would strongly recommend that you go down either the joint venture route or the shared revenue route, um, but have an agreement with the developer that you can notionally label one of the turbines as being the community's turbine, uh, but without all of the legal uh, complexity. So we've talked about the disadvantages and advantages already uh, on this uh, on the previous slide. I won't uh, go into it in a lot more detail, um, but I think the uh, yeah, each of these has benefits and disbenefits. Um, we've gone through them all already. I want to say that uh, we will make these slides available at the end of the webinar. So please don't feel you need to desperately scribble down lots of notes. Uh, I possibly should have said that at the beginning. So apologies to anyone who's. Uh, run out of bits of scrap paper. Um, 
Sources of funding, this is the last bit, uh, you'll be uh, relieved to hear. Um, we thought we wanted to touch on uh, just a few of the key uh, sources of funding that communities might access for shared ownership. So I'll rattle through these quite quickly. Um, so the, the first one is not for shared ownership. The first one is just a project finance loan. Uh, how do they work? This is a scene setter, so we can compare everything else to it afterwards. Um, term, as we've said, typically 7 to 15 years. Uh, the overall interest rate, um, typically 3.5% to 5.5%, that consists of uh, various different elements. So I'm quoting an all-in rate there. Um, upfront costs, typically 1% to 2% of the loan amount. That includes uh, due diligence costs as well as uh, fees to the bank, because banks are never knowingly underpaid. Um, the advantages of this are that there's a low ongoing cost um, and there's a well-developed funding market it's quite competitive the disadvantages are that it can be very expensive and time consuming to put in place um, and that goes back to the point that we made on i think the second or third slide where we said that the only security that the bank has is the project itself so the bank has to go into this assuming that in a downside case they would own and operate the project. Um, they, they believe me, they will turn over every single stone in order to make sure that they're comfortable with the project before they lend money to it for exactly that reason. Um, so that's a commercial loan. The rest of these are shared ownership um, potential uh, funding sources. So crowdfunding is the first one. Um, these are becoming pretty common. There are lots of different kinds. You might get community share offers, community bonds, community debentures. Uh, there are lots of different platforms around the internet that structure things in slightly different ways. Um, you will all uh, know names like um, Energy for All, uh, Community Shares Scotland, um, Abundance. There, there are heaps of them. Um, Irrespective of what they call themselves, the risk return profile for investors is, is normally pretty similar. Um, so they will typically receive a 4 to 6% uh, return. Now that might be called community share dividend. It might be called uh, an interest. It might be called a preferred return. There are lots of different words for it. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's what the investors get in return for their investment. Uh, upfront costs can be quite high for these. Um, it takes quite a lot of effort to raise um, this type of this type of uh, funding because you have to engage with a lot of people, um, and you'll need some uh, advisors uh, to help you with the uh, Financial Services and Markets Act. Um, there are rules around uh, marketing to the public, so you need to make sure that you are uh, compliant with those. Uh, you'll need legal advisors to go through the documents and all of that sort of stuff. Um, the term of this type of thing, uh, typically 10 to 20 years, but it can be open-ended. It can be for the life of the project. It really depends on the structure. Um, funding amount, we've typically when we see um, these types of structures, it, it's raising an amount of money between one and five million pounds. And if I had to, if I had to narrow that down, I would say one to two. Is, is typical, um, sometimes a bit lower. Um, but la larger amounts have been raised for other things that are not renewable energy related, so things like big land buyouts and that sort of stuff. Um, the advantages of them, well, it's, they're great in terms of letting local investors uh, participate in a project. Um, one thing I should say is you can structure these um, very flexibly. So if you wanted to give a preference to local investors within um, five miles of a particular project, for instance, then, then you could do that. Um, and the, the actual uh, headline cost of the funding at four to six percent is, is relatively low as well. Um, if you compare that with the senior debt, I mean, it's, it's a little higher as a range, but not materially higher. Um, the disadvantages of them are really around the lack of certainty, because quite often in shared ownership, you'll have a time deadline by which you need to 
make an investment or the community needs to make an investment. And one of the key difficulties with this type of structure is that on the day when you decide to launch your community, uh, your, sorry, your crowdfunding effort, you really don't know um, how long it's going to take. And you also don't know whether you're going to hit your target. And you might not know until you know, two, two days before it closes or, or indeed on the day it closes. So um, that lack of visibility can be difficult. And one of the things that, um, that we are keen to explore at CARES is the opportunity to use this type of funding in conjunction with other funding that has more certainty. So for instance, um, would it be possible for a community to get a loan from a social impact investor uh, in order to give them the certainty of the funding and then run a crowdfunding campaign in parallel, which would allow them to replace some or all of that loan with crowdfunding in, in due course. That type of structure uh, gives them the flexibility to, to run the crowdfunding at the same time as having the certainty that they won't miss the opportunity to invest in the project. So that type of structure is something we're quite keen on exploring uh, here at CARES. Um, the, the other big disadvantage, as I mentioned, is the substantial regulatory risk. And I think um, really the key to that is to have good advisors, if you're doing um, a crowdfunding uh, campaign, to make sure that you've got um, the, the firm legal and financial footing uh, if, if ever there was to be uh, more regulatory scrutiny of this market. Um, we've talked about ETH a lot. Um, we're obviously enormous fans of ETH here at CARES. Um, they uh, have really filled a, a big funding gap over the last um, several years in this market, and, and we all uh, hope that they will continue to do so. Um, I've, I've put the word in, in cost of funding, I've said six to eight percent, which is uh, it's uh, depend, depends on the project itself, the technology, the stage of development and, and all of that sort of uh, all of those considerations. Um, I've used the word mezzanine debt here. Um, Mark was encouraging me not to use a lot of jargon, but unfortunately, this particular word uh, slipped through the net. Um, all that means is that it it looks like debt and it feels like debt. Um, but the senior debt gets paid first, and then the mezzanine debt gets paid, and then the shareholders. So it sort of sits in between the senior debt and the shareholders, a little bit like a mezzanine floor uh, in a big supermarket, so that's why it's called mezzanine debt. Um, the term typically around eight years, uh, but again, EF are very flexible, um, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's very much um, project-specific. Um, total funding amount, uh, we know that this, this year, this um, financial year, fiscal year, the total budget is around 20 million. Um, portfolio concentration rules um, are likely to limit the size of any individual investment. So I think it's fair to say it's unlikely that EF would invest, invest the whole 20 million in a single project. Um, but again, that's, that's for discussion with EF and, and we're not... Um, able to speak on, on their behalf in terms of what their maximum investment size might might be. Um, it's, it's relatively flexible, as it says here. Um, and I think the, the only disadvantage is that if typically is a follow-on funder, so would rely on a senior lender or a lead funder for any uh, due diligence reports. Um, and the only reason I flag that as being a difficulty is uh, because it just depends on having a good relationship with any senior lender. Um, obviously, if there wasn't a senior lender in place, um, then there would be an additional due diligence cost because EF would need to get themselves comfortable with the project. Um, develop a loan. This is something we've seen quite a lot of. So this is the example where a developer uh, takes the project. Uh, all the way through the development process, gets consent, and then offers the community body, a uh, community organization, the um, ability to invest up to, let's say, 10% in the project. Um, the community might uh, not be able 
to raise the funding or might simply not have the time to pursue uh, a fundraising. And so the developer will say, um, dear community, we will lend you the money in order to make this investment. So the developer plays the part of both the majority shareholder, but also the community's uh, funder or funding partner. Now, it's probably worth going straight to the disadvantages at the bottom of this uh, page because there is the potential there for conflicts of interest to arise uh, pretty, pretty obviously. So uh, any time this type of arrangement is proposed, uh, I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again, please, please pick up the telephone to CARES um, and talk to us about it because um, we would strongly recommend that you get some um, really copper-bottomed uh, legal and financial advice about any arrangement uh, that is proposed. Um, interest rates can vary quite widely between 6 and 10%. Um, again, uh, mezzanine debt typically, um, so like the EF funding, it normally ranks behind the senior debt but in front of the equity. Although it is worth saying that as with um, some of the uh, shared revenue projects, it, it, it ought to be possible to structure this in such a way that it ranks before the senior debt. So it, it counts as a project cost rather than a funding cost. Um, and it, if it is possible to do that, that could be quite attractive. Um, funding amount again is negotiable, but typically what we see is the developer uh, funds the entire shared ownership stake. Um, advantages are it's likely to be very inexpensive to put this in place because, of course, there's uh, CARES support available for advisory costs. Um, it's likely to be very fast to put in place because the developer will have a pretty clear idea of what they're willing and not willing to offer. Um, and finally, the due diligence requirements, at least on the developer side, will be uh, very limited because, of course, they will know the project better than anyone else in, in the country. Um, the due diligence requirements on the community side will involve primarily legal and financial work reviewing uh, any proposed contracts and arrangements. But again, that shouldn't lead to a big uh, delay. Um, local authority we added in. This is um, still, I have to say, fairly rare. Um, but we see it as a potential route. Uh, it is something we've seen uh, in England on one or two occasions. Local authorities have access to a pot of money called the Public Works Loan Board, which is very low cost uh, funding, um, uh, around two to three percent. And so there is potentially a route whereby a local authority could help a community to make a community investment, or sorry, a shared ownership investment in a renewable energy project. What the local authority could do, for instance, is would be to borrow the money from the Public Works Loan Board and then lend it to the community at a preferential interest rate. Um, the term and funding amount are likely to be flexible. Um, the advantages are that it's low cost. Um, could, be, could be an interesting route for financing post-subsidy projects because, as we've seen, the equity returns on those are likely to be lower uh, than funders have seen in the past. The disadvantages are that it's a very unusual route to funding. It's, it's really only happened once, and that was in England. Um, the structure would need to be very carefully investigated uh, with some uh, you know, really uh, excellent legal advice um, to look at things like state aid, um, lending criteria, any liability the local authority might be under, any liabilities for the community. Um, and, and ultimately, from the local authority's point of view, they would need to be extremely comfortable with the project itself, because ultimately the risk will sit with them uh, of any underperformance or inability to, to repay. Um, so one to keep in mind, um, but I think it's fair to say this is a uh, not a common route uh, and not something we've seen before in Scotland, to the best of my knowledge. 
Finally, social impact investors. Um, there are quite a lot of these, so I've put a few names there. Uh, Esme Fairbairn, Social Investment Scotland, Big Issue Invest, Charity State Foundation, um, Joseph Roundtree. There's, there's quite a lot of these types of vehicles. Um, they typically lend at around the 4 to 6% interest rate. Again, it's mezzanine debt, that, that word again. So it sits in between the senior debt and the equity. Um, their term is typically 5 to 10 years. Their loan amount is typically 0 to 5 million. Um, again, if I had to narrow that down, I would say typically two to four. Um, you can raise larger amounts, though, because they do sometimes act as a club. So you might get, um, you know, ESMEs investing alongside the Charities Aid Foundation or something like that in order to raise bigger fundraising amounts. Um, the advantages are that they can lend at lower rates because unlike a lot of other funders who really look only at risk and return, um, these investors also look at the social impact. So it's very important to be aware of that because if you do want to go and talk to them to try and raise money for a shared ownership project, you have to be very, very clear on what the benefit is to the local community of making this investment. Um, and it needs to be uh, well, well thought through and robust and defensible because um, they will grill you on it. Um, and I think that's a good thing because that's their mandate. Um, the lenders are quite flexible. If debt needs to be reprofiled, um, if the project doesn't perform as expected, they tend to be very understanding because uh, really for them, the money is a vehicle to stimulate the social impact. Um, so the social impact is the thing they will always have at the forefront of their mind. The disadvantage, um, I, I, I've got a typing error there, I'm afraid, a typo, the dreaded typo, uh, potential for conflicts of interest. Uh, that is not the case. The disadvantage here is the reporting that's required. So because they are very keen to understand um, progress being made towards social targets, you quite often get stringent reporting criteria that might be semi-annual or annual requirements to report on progress made towards specific targets or key performance indicators. Um, and, and again, they will, they will grill you on that. So they're, they're pretty um, fierce about uh, following up any commitments that have been made towards uh, social targets. Um, you'll be relieved to see this slide. That's the end. <laughs> I hope that the um, uh, webinar has been helpful. Please. Um, if you, if you haven't asked questions, if there's anything we haven't covered, um, get in contact with us. Um, my details are on the screen now. Mark's details are there as well. Um, please uh, email us any time of day or night. Um, call us, um, preferably not in the middle of the night. Um, this, uh, the slides will be available, uh, as I say, so you'll have our contact details available uh, if you want to get in touch with us. If, uh, if something occurs to you suddenly in the middle of next week that we didn't cover. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to the webinar. Uh, and I don't know if, Mark, you want to say anything else? No, just thank you for that very comprehensive uh, coverage of the, of the topic. Yes, indeed. And uh, I think it just goes to show that uh, Simon's the man to talk to uh, in our team here about any of these issues because they're quite complex and there's a lot involved there so uh, don't be scared to get in touch and we'll put you on to the right person thank you very much thanks everyone um, we, we've had a question about where where the slides are going to be um, the, the answer is that because I'm only part time at CARES, I'm not completely clear on that, uh, but we will put them somewhere and we will put a note uh, out in the CARES bulletin uh, telling people where they can be found. Sorry, I, I should have said that the next CARES bulletin is due out uh, imminently. I believe it's next week, so there won't be long to wait.
Yes, so uh, you do need to sign up to the CARES Bulletin. Uh, if you haven't already, um, then uh, it's on, available on the website, on the Local Energy Scotland website. Um, very, very easy to follow the link there and type in your email address. Um, it's a riveting uh, read, um, and I'm profoundly disappointed that everyone on the call hasn't already signed up to it uh, at least three times. Brilliant. Well, that's all the questions, and thank you, everyone, for your time. And uh, as I say, any, any questions, please do get in touch with, with either myself or Mark.